For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. Continuing our investigation of the great works from the Age of the Pyramids, in this episode we are going to look at the greatest pyramid builder in Egyptian history. He lived nearly 5,000 years ago and is responsible for the construction of more pyramids than any other ruler of Egypt. He successfully completed the first true pyramid in Egypt, and all this before the Great Pyramid ever rose from the ground. In fact, without him, the Great Pyramid wouldn't have been possible at the time it was built. Who was this Great Pyramid builder? Find out here. Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide, a helping hand for visiting historic places. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how best to enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Natalie and me on our trek through Egypt homeland of the ancient Egyptians, Kushites, Libyans, Asiatics, and Greeks. Come on, let's go. Today was the day we went to explore three massive pyramids that were built for the first king of Egypt's fourth dynasty during the peak years of the Old Kingdom. His name was Sneferu, and although he built more than three pyramids, there are smaller ones attributed to him as well, and we may find more with his name on them, the three largest are his greatest. We're going to talk about why he built them, how they illustrate the gradual improvement of pyramid design, and what is inside them. My colleague in history, Natalie, and I, along with our videographer, Noah, stayed our last night at the Giza Pyramids View Guest House in Giza. We enjoyed our stay there, and Noah and I started the morning with a complimentary Egyptian breakfast. Natalie was sick, so you won't be seeing as much of her in this episode. But she was there with us behind the scenes the whole time. We met up with our local guide, Ihab, and he picked up food for the rest of the crew. I really enjoyed the street food that he brought to us on this trip. Ihab knows a lot about this area. If you are ever in the country, I recommend him heartily as a guide. Details below the video. The sites that contain the pyramids of Sneferu are Dashur and Medum, both royal necropolises to the south of Cairo, one near ancient Menefer, Memphis, and the other near ancient Tepihu, Busiris. We saw some dates on the side of the road. We're going to go pick some up. Because we are heading from north to south, we will be visiting the three pyramids in reverse chronological order of when they were made. This means we will start with the last one. Hello. 
King Sneferu built two pyramids at Dashur. Kings of the Middle Kingdom also built pyramids here, specifically Amenemhat III and Senusret III. Unfortunately, these are off limits to the public. To see Sneferu's two pyramids cost 60 Egyptian pounds, which is about two bucks US. I can't tell you how excited we were to see before us, for the first time, the world's oldest known colossal, smooth-sided, true pyramid. Sneferu, known later on to the Greeks as Saurus, ruled during the 26th century BCE, give or take. He was the father of Khufu, the owner of the Great Pyramid at Giza. The exact length of Sneferu's reign is unknown but contemporary records seem to indicate that he ruled for at least 28 years. Sneferu's two pyramids at Dashur are known as the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid, or North Pyramid. The Bent Pyramid had structural issues, and this is the reason why archaeologists believe Sneferu worked on it first, before deciding to move on and try again with the Red Pyramid, done with a gentler slope. In fact, so gentle is the Red Pyramid's slope 43 degrees, that it carries the distinction of having the lowest angle of all Egyptian pyramids. No doubt Sneferu was cautious so as not to fail again. Interestingly, Amenemhat III of the Middle Kingdom also seems to have encountered subsidence and cracking in his pyramid here, and maybe that's why he had another one built at Hawara, which we will see in a later episode. The world's first known true pyramid. We know this complex was built by Sneferu because his image and name were found in the remains of the mortuary temple of the pyramid. Documents indicate that the bent pyramid was called Sneferu Shines South. So an educated guess would be that this one was called Sneferu Shines North. It was dubbed the Red Pyramid by onlookers who noted the reddish hue of the limestones. These of course would have been covered by casing stones when the pyramid was new, so the name comes from the times much later, after the casing stones had been looted. Locals today call it the Bat Pyramid. It is about 344 feet high, 105 meters, but the difficulty of measuring it makes this just an estimation. The limestone was taken from quarries to the immediate southwest of the pyramid, and remains of the supply ramps used to transport the stones from there to the pyramid were found. The beautiful white casing stones come from Tura Quarry, further away. A limestone pyramidion, or capstone, very rare to find, has been uncovered near the Red Pyramid, and reconstructed. It's now on display there, but since its angle of inclination is different, from that of the Red Pyramid, it seems unlikely that it was ever used on it. It does, however, match approximately the original angle of the Bent Pyramid. So it could be that it was meant to be used there, but when the angle of the Bent Pyramid was changed, they tossed it. Graffiti made by workers on backs and sides of casing stones and backing stones, both on the exterior of the pyramid and in passageways, give valuable dates. For example, a fragment of a casing stone had a graffito that refers to the laying of the western cornerstone at the time of the 15th cattle census of the king's reign. Now, we don't know for sure exactly which years the cattle census took place, but it was sometimes taken every year and sometimes every other year. Anyway, we have enough information from writings on blocks at various levels to suggest that one-fifth of the pyramid stones were placed over a period of two to four years. The neatly executed construction of the Red Pyramid would suggest that the builders really knew what they were doing. And it would be a surprise for us to see the first true pyramid built so efficiently, but knowing as we do now that Sneferu had previously struggled to build one and failed, it makes sense to see the earlier problems corrected here. The pyramid is entered from high up on the side. From here, a long corridor descends to ground level. <laughs> 
two almost identical antechambers are found here that reach high up and have corbelled roofs. We've seen this corbelling in the Great Pyramid at Giza, but this is where the method was first perfected. In, in, uh, in the Great Pyramid, they have this too, it just has a ceiling though, right? Yeah, yeah. So when you open here, you're gonna go to the second chamber. Uh, notice here the stones are uh, unfinished. Uh, they have yet to be smoothed. They never got to that. Um, they didn't quite finish. And you can even see some of the, uh, the, the beveling they were starting out to do here, but that's not done either. But clear indications that all this work was being done by hand. If you look here, this is how the, the wood used to go together, so you can climb as a stairs. This is generally thought to be the burial chamber, though this is by no means certain. It is built right within the masonry of the pyramid. The floor of the chamber has been dug out, and this was done long ago, probably by ancient looters, presumably to find something. But they dug out more than 200 tons of stone. One wonders whether they found what they were looking for. During an excavation here in 1950, human remains were found here, and animal bones too. The human remains belonged to a male individual who died past middle age, and there were signs of mummification of the body, but as far as I've been able to tell, no scientific analysis or carbon dating has been done on the remains. So we do not yet know if they belong to Sneferu. Almost nothing of Sneferu's mortuary temple has survived, but from what we can tell, it was small and simple, much inferior to that of his son Khufu at the Great Pyramid. He had a modest valley temple too, but no traces of a causeway between the two temples has been found. This may indicate that work was completed in a hurry, perhaps even by Khufu when his father died. But now, it was time for us to take a look at the pyramid Sneferu worked on before the Red Pyramid. It was, in fact, the second pyramid he worked on, and perhaps the only one that he had a hand in from start to finish. A stela found here shows a seated figure of Sneferu. It was officially called Sneferu Shines, South, but today we call it the Bent Pyramid. It's about the same height as the Red Pyramid, about 345 feet or 105 meters. Here we are at the Bent Pyramid of Dashur, as it is called, and you can kind of tell why. This is King Sneferu's second attempt at a pyramid, our best guess. And uh, as you see, partway up the pyramid, the angle changes. And the reason for that is because as they were building the pyramid, a crack appeared in the main burial chamber, 
which resulted in a structural problem for the pyramid. And they realized that in order for them to continue, they couldn't keep going up at the same, same angle. So they changed the angle slightly. And that's why you see the structure as it looks now. Its angle of slope was 54 degrees up to the bend and 43 degrees thereafter. And inside, there is evidence that the pyramid was started with a slope of 60 degrees. Also, in the early stages, the stone courses were laid with the stones sloping inward, but about halfway up, they began to be laid horizontally. All this is evidence of emergency changes in the slope due to structure problems with subsidence. Some Egyptologists have surmised that Sneferu, dissatisfied with how the Bent Pyramid was turning out, began work on the Red Pyramid before the Bent Pyramid was even completed. One of the aspects of this pyramid that I really love is that so many more of the casing stones are preserved on it than on any of the other pyramids. Of course, plunderers did come at this one too, and you can see how they began stripping the casing stones from the corners and from bottom to top. But there still is so much of the original casing to marvel at. Of all the pyramids we ventured into, this one had the most complex series of passages and took the longest to get through. Another unique aspect of the Bent Pyramid is that it had two internal structures, one with an entrance on the north side and one with an entrance on the west side. Why Sneferu wanted two internal structures, no one really knows. We entered from the north. As you can see, the ceiling's very low. You can see the block from here. R oh, right. It will be here and to, to close the... This would have been blocked with a stone. Yeah. Uh, apparently we're only halfway down. modern stairway leads up. The workers also may have used a wooden stairway or ladder, which would have been removed after the king was interred in the burial chamber above. making our way through a tunnel that connects the northern internal structure to the western internal structure. The tunnel was made by hacking through the existing masonry, so it wasn't part of the original design. Someone seemed to know where they wanted to go, however. Now we are in the western internal structure and at a higher level. I could feel some cool air coming in, and that's because the passageway you see here, which is partly blocked off now, is the western entrance to the pyramid. It goes to the outside, 
and it's bringing in air from out there. You want to see an Indiana Jones style trap? Well, this shaft right here is one such trap is to prevent robbers from getting in further. Well, would, would there have been like a... Yeah, the, here, look, if we look from the, here, this side uh -huh. is still. But for, starting from here, uh -huh. from this side, the cut, and it go down. And they would have fallen into the hole. Those entering from the western entrance, if not alert, would have fallen into the shaft. But the connecting tunnel, as you can see, bypasses the trap. Here are the words put here by John Shea Pering when he discovered these passages in 1839. 20th, 18. 18. Was that 30? Uh, this 18, is 3. 39. 39. 1839. Right. Yeah. yeah, discovered October 20th, 1839. Right. So right. if we look at this, at this side here, that's where it used to like hold like one wooden thing. And if you move it, this block of uh, limestone will close the area totally. Oh, so you get rid of this and it comes down? Comes down, close it. Nice. That's a, that would have been when they were finished, finished the stuff finished. in the tomb, they'd knock it out, yeah. and it would close. The builders shored up this chamber with scaffolding of cedar wood beams. This chamber probably was intended for Sneferu's interment, but it is questionable whether he was ever put here. There are some Egyptologists who think that he may have been buried in this one and that somebody else took it out. But I don't think they get out of anything out from this room. Too many traps? Yeah, there. too many and the tunnels, how are you gonna get a coffin from? Uh -huh. How are you gonna get a sort of coffin this out of this? That's true. Yeah. yeah. It'd be impossible. No, no way. You have to pick it to pieces. Yeah. Cut it to the pieces and then, then you put it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only way to pick it out. There is no mortuary temple attached to the pyramid, but there is a small chapel on one side. Inside it was an offering table shaped like the Hetep sign and two stelas that bore Sneferu's name. And there was a causeway with walls of Tura limestone that led to the pyramid from a valley temple, the earliest of its kind known. It had features of both a valley temple and a mortuary temple. Later practice would separate the two. Interestingly, at this valley temple, a long-lasting cult to Sneferu functioned. He was especially popular in the Middle Kingdom. Long after the cults of Khufu, Khafra, and Menkara ceased to operate, that of Sneferu continued. Northeast of the pyramid was a cemetery of Mastabas for the elites of Sneferu's court. <laughs> this is what uh, going through pyramids will do to your shoes. 
Ehab lent me his sneakers. The Pyramid of Meidum today stands as a tower of three steps rising from a pile of debris. To get into Meidum costs 60 Egyptian pounds, as at Dashur, which is about two dollars in US money. Before we visited the pyramid itself, we took a look at the mastabas next to it. We know mastaba 16, as it is called, belonged to Nefermaat, one of Sneferu's sons. But mastaba 17 is especially interesting. No one knows for sure who this mastaba belonged to, but its position, size, and quality of its stonework clearly indicate it was a person of importance. Welcome, my doom. That that's the, goes to the original entrance to the tomb. So that's where they actually came in through here. Where we came in was where people dug into it. Yeah. <laughs> the sarcophagus. Oh, Birds in here. Oh, look at all the bats! Ah. <laughs> wow! Look at this! A granite sarcophagus wow. from the old kingdom. Very basic in those days. Big. Yeah, the way they. Uh, lifted the lid, they put a, a beam under here and they can lift it up on either side. Not super smooth, but 
Smooth enough. Yeah. This is great. It may be the tomb of another prince. Some have surmised that it belonged to Snefru's predecessor, Huni, whose final resting place is unknown. This is great. You don't often hear about this tomb. That they do, because everyone talks about the pyramid. This is great. Good. Good. Very good. good. The mastaba was filled with limestone chips from the building of the pyramid, which means it was created around the same time. Up to this point, the oldest sarcophagus I had yet seen was that of Khufu in the Great Pyramid. This one is even older. Sometimes you just gotta crawl. Next, we made our way to the pyramid investigating first the temple that sits on the east side. This, uh, this, there was a dock there on the river, and then uh, the causeway led up here to the funerary temple associated with the pyramid. It is so small that it might better be called a chapel. Signs are that it was built during an attempt to turn the step pyramid into a smooth-sided one. Maybe by this point they knew the pyramid would not be the one to house Sneferu's body, so they didn't need a full mortuary temple. The pyramid ended up being a cenotaph for the king instead of an actual tomb. These were never finished, they're just blank, but they originally were going to have hieroglyphs on them. Two round-topped stelas were found at the chapel. They had Horus depicted on them, but were never inscribed. The chapel walls were not dressed yet either. It may be that Snefru died before the chapel was completed and his successor Khufu needed work to be done elsewhere. The Medum Pyramid, called Snefru Endures, probably was the first that Snefru worked on. Its layout copies that seen for earlier royal tombs at Saqqara, and it would seem this is the first colossal royal tomb monument built outside of Saqqara. Keep in mind that up to this point, Djoser's Step Pyramid was the only royal monumental tomb standing. This pyramid is sometimes said to have been started by Huni, Snefru's predecessor. But Huni's name appears nowhere here, and Snefru's name is attested on many of the blocks and in the chapel and in the nearby mastabas. The Medum Pyramid was built in stages. First, it was made as a step pyramid with seven steps. But then when construction reached just past halfway, the king decided he wanted eight steps. And this eight-stepped pyramid was completed, but not the full pyramid complex. It was then that the possibility of the creation of a true pyramid, a smooth-sided one, was discussed. And Snefru's men began work on the Bent Pyramid at Dashur, leaving the project here undone. Nevertheless, it looks like Snefru's builders did return here late in his reign to try to finish the Medum project as a cenotaph. Hey, might as well not let it go to waste. And at that time, they attempted to turn this pyramid into a smooth-sided one. Its slope had the same angle as that of Khufu's Pyramid at Giza. Or maybe it's better to say Khufu's Pyramid at Giza has the same slope as the pyramid here. We don't actually know how far they got, but we can say that the Medum Pyramid represents both the very beginning and the very end of Snefru's building program. It was once thought that the debris around the pyramid was caused by a collapse, but excavations in the debris have revealed only later Egyptian remains, which has led archaeologists to conclude that the debris was caused by later Egyptians looting the outer layers for building material. If you look at a cross-section of the pyramid, you can see how the different styles of construction reveal the different stages in its building. Initially, the masons used the traditional inward-leaning accretions, but more regular courses of stone were employed for the final stage. 
The burial chamber is at ground level, but the entry passage descends below ground level before ascending to the burial chamber. I'm with the gang, 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 boys. Oops. I'm lost. It's Monday. It's round that day. <laughs> 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 We see the corbeling used again here, but what's interesting is that this is the first time it was used. Remember, we are looking at these pyramids in reverse order. The first attempt at corbeling, you can see, is more primitive. This pole right here, one of the original wooden poles, they went across it in here, see? The cedar logs embedded in the masonry may have been for support, but they could also have been used to raise the sarcophagus or its lid. Normally we think of an Egyptian king building one pyramid, as it would take a number of years to complete. Some kings did have two pyramids constructed during their reigns, but Snefru had three. Well, more than three, but three large ones. So the big question is, how did he have the time? He did likely reign for many years, but maybe a better question is, did he have the money and a large enough workforce? After all, these pyramids need not have been built consecutively, and evidence suggests that there was indeed overlap in the work. This was the height of the old kingdom, so he had the wealth. He just needed the manpower. But I think there was plenty of that too. All able-bodied citizens were required to work on the king's building projects. It was part of their tax. It's difficult to estimate how long it would take to build a pyramid, but if, as the markings on the stones of the Red Pyramid indicate, it took two to four years to place one-fifth of the stones, that would mean the whole pyramid would have taken between 10 and 20 years. Snefru may have reigned as long as 48 years. If the projects were partly simultaneous, it is entirely possible that the work could have been accomplished. After Maidum, we drove southward to Beni Suif and checked into the Jewel Inn, which was very nice. <laughs> Our room was clean and comfy. But we were hungry, so it was time to go out for some Egyptian food. And let me tell you, we found an amazing spot. It's called Ali Kabar, and was clearly popular with the locals, because it was packed. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> wow. 
طب هو هيجيب لنا الضوء ناخد لنا بقى ولا طب ايه هناكل في ايدينا؟ What should I go for? I'm gonna try one of these. I don't even know what it is, but... In our next episode, we will be venturing further south into territory less traveled by foreign tourists to visit amazing rock tombs of Akhoris and Beni Hassan, neither of which are you likely to have seen on YouTube before. So stay tuned and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time.